Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jason Merch. I'm the director of script services at Stage 32 and the host of the Writer's Room every Wednesday at four o'clock. Uh, we are here today because it's week one, webcast one, of our That's a Movie logline uh, contest, the sequel. Uh, and if you know anything about good sequels, they have both recurring characters and we expand the universe and bring on new and exciting characters as well. So you're gonna see some returning judges here. You're gonna see some brand new judges we brought in just for this competition. Um, but this is all about you guys and your uh, storytell storytelling ability uh, within one or two sentences. Um, you were obviously invited throughout the course of uh, March, the month of March to submit as many log lines as you wanted uh, for review by our industry panel that I'll announce in just a second. Um, and we chose uh, with them some of the best that, that stood out for us for any number of reasons, whether it's uh, a big conceptual hook, uh, overall creativity, the ability to uh, convey whatever that uh, hook or story or narrative is, whether it's a feature or a series. And we are going to award three lucky folks uh, some very cool Stage 32 script services uh, and education prizes today. Uh, but if you're not familiar with Stage 32, it is the largest online platform for networking and education uh, for film, television, digital creatives, um, really around the world. We have over 750 members worldwide. We are in every, uh, nearly every country. Uh, I like to say we're on every continent because I think there's probably somebody making a Penguins documentary in Antarctica right now who's probably a member. Um, so we're everywhere and we love to have you be a part of it. Uh, as you all know, um, Stage 32 is completely free to join. It always will be. And you are immediately connected to like-minded individuals, very much like the panel that, uh, that sits before me um, as well. Uh, again, it takes 30 seconds. And the last thing about uh, Stage 32 that I love is that you're able to build a profile uh, that includes hosting your log lines and includes hosting your screenplays and your bio and things of that nature that help you sort of advance your career uh, in the business and uh, allow you to make tremendous career leaps. We're all about uh, sort of democratization of the industry. And uh, I am very fortunate to be joined uh, by our guests this week. I'm gonna start introducing them uh, one by one in the order that I see them. Uh, we're gonna kick it off with Mike Visa. Uh, Mike is, uh, like I said, our returning uh, judge from last year. He was on our first webcast last year when we did this. Hey, Mike, how are you? Hey, how are you doing? I was the first. I didn't know. You were the first. You were the it pioneer. So well. you were, you're either the pioneer or the guinea pig. I don't know which one you would prefer to be called. Um, but, you know, Mike, like I said, to tell us for, for obviously, you know, folks in the audience who, who don't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself and your career. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so like Jason just said, he's asked me to give you guys a context of what my career has been like. And the, I do think it's important for you to know the backgrounds of myself, Janine and Nat, because we're gonna pick these things and you gotta know where our heads are at. You have to understand that Hollywood is very big and very varied. And sometimes it's it's a good idea to, to kind of target, you know, to, to target your career towards people who are just gonna be naturally a little bit more into what you wanna do. Um, so uh, I came out here uh, about 25 years ago from the south side of Chicago with no training in anything but art, um, no idea of how Hollywood worked. So if this feels familiar to a lot of people, hopefully I have some sense of hope for you. Uh, no idea what I was doing. And because there was no such thing as stage 32, I lived homeless in a car on Venice Beach for six months and battled gangs for parking spaces and ran away from policemen and grifted tourists. See what stage 32 has prevented your life from turning into. You're not going to have anything like my criminal record when you're my age. <clears throat> You'll have a better one. So, but eventually I got work at the big studios. And as uh, Nat has asked me to say, I, I should mention the fact that I have worked with some really awesome people. I was trained by Steven Spielberg, Ralph Bakshi. I was at, uh, di I was uh, uh, Jeff with Jeffrey Katzenberg at the very beginning of DreamWorks. I was the one, I was there at Amblin when uh, DreamWorks kind of took it over. Um, I got to work with all those people. They all got to teach me. I ended up at Disney for 11 years as an animator and storyboard artist, eventually becoming a director on a short there before I left. Um, 
and oh, that was all that was all the two D stuff. So that was from Lion King to the uh, to the um, Sweating Bullets. Then I went to uh, Warner Brothers, and because I had worked on some live action animated combo films with Stephen back in the day, I started doing you know the the Space Jam and Looney Tunes back in action and those combo films that were so big back in the '90s and will fail to be big in eight months when they release again. But um, the and then from there, I started doing independent stuff. So again, just to put your head in, I came from the studio system. I was doing fine in the studio system. I was developing films for Warner Brothers. And I honestly just didn't want to make studio films anymore. And I don't know, either you come to that point or you don't. Either one of those people likes working in studios or you just have to go independent. You know, I know a lot of people start independent spend their whole life dreaming about studios, but I was the other way around. Um, and I ended up uh, directing uh, a movie for Rob Zombie called uh, El Super Bisto, which was an R-rated uh, animated film. And then the Weinsteins brought me in to do the Hoodwink stuff. And then I quit that after, as soon as the moment I could deliver the film, I ran for my life, <laughs> the horrifying, creepy guy. And then I ended up in um, uh, doing two R-rated anime movies called Dead Space, uh, Dead Space and um, Dante's Inferno, which are very hard, very r uh, anime projects and then I wanted and then I ended up moving from there to do the sweetest family CG film in the world based on Postman Pathy <laughs> you know and I wrote all I co-wrote all these I directed all these and you know they were wonderful experiences that got me out traveling the world and um, I did I even did some really strange rides I should do a class on someday I did some, <laughs> I did some really intense rides but then I came back uh, when my uh, son got ill and I uh, created a uh, Helped to co-create uh, Wabbit a little bit on uh, a show that was having some trouble at you know, finding its feet at Warner Brothers. And then I uh, pitched and ran as showrunner, head writer, the reboot for Wacky Races, mm -hmm. which is kind of um, the class I teach now on, at studio at, at, at this, at, I, don't know, I don't know how to say it. The, the class I teach now kind of evolved from Wacky Races. And by that means what I do is now, I teach a series of seminars and classes where we take somebody if they've got an idea or let's say a log line and we teach them slowly over the course of five weeks to develop it into a pitch package, a professional pitch package, like the ones I use to sell my movies, like the ones I use to sell my series. And usually they're four or five pages. And, you know, we talk about like, you know, log line premise, you know, character descriptions, episode suggestions and, and how to structure all that. And I teach that um, now with stage 32 and it was kind of an, almost an accident. And I can tell you this, it's like people just kept asking, like, what do I do with a log line? <laughs> so yeah. I ended up teaching a class about like, oh, well, if you really want to sell this, we do this. And then that class developed into another class where we actually write the pilot. Because in my experience, if you want to get a job on your own production, but even if you want to just make yourself available for another job, um, what you want to do is you want to walk in with all the materials people need to see you as somebody who could make them money. So you walk in with a log line and a pitch package that shows you've got, you know, the ability to organize thoughts and think about money and budget and sustainability, whether this is a movie or whether or not it's a series and a script. So now they think of you as a writer, they think of you as an artist, and maybe they think of you as somebody who's obviously motivated and competent they want to work with. So all, the, all those jobs I was talking to, you know, I got like a recently directed a, a season of Paradise PD and uh, I finished a live action movie that just came out called Dolphin Island. And there's some, and I did a podcast that actually turned into a sci-fi series that just got optioned. So there's a lot of, all that though comes from the fact of being able to walk into a meeting when you've only got maybe five minutes before someone is gonna you know, make their judgment about you. Yeah. And having material that reflected well on me but also made people think, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to make Mike's terrible movie idea, but I'll hire him to direct mine. Or like, I'm not going right. to make, I'm not going to make this series, but maybe you could be good in a writer's room. And I've seen that happen over the course of my career mentoring people is people go in and pitch shows and they end up in writer's rooms. So sure. that's why I'm here today. And that's, uh, that's my backstory. Back to Nate. Well, thank you. Well, you touched on two really interesting things um, because it related to our next two judges, um, because Janine uh, Jeffries here, uh, our next judge, who's starting out with us for the first time in this webcast, which I'm very excited. Janine, come, you come from very much that sort of studio route. And then Nat, who I'm going to induce in a second, comes from the sort of the, the very much the independent, you know, production route. So, but I want to start with you, Janine. So 
again, you're obviously, you know, um, somebody who's worked with Stage 32 for quite a while, but give us a little background on you as an executive and what you're doing over at CBS, uh, Biocom CBS. I'm not sure I want to follow Mike. Um, <laughs> my backstory is I started out as an actress. I used to be on All My Children and a couple of other things, but moved here to continue to pursue acting and found that it coming from soaps, it was a little harder. So I started working at DreamWorks and doing contracts for actors and working in the um, business development section and really realized I liked to do a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. I still act whenever I can, but I like the behind the scenes and finding a log line and seeing where that can go and then developing it and, and then actually seeing it on screen from start to finish. So I was at DreamWorks for a little over three years, moved to Paramount when they were still kind of partners and then they separated and we had a lot of layoffs. Um, I've done some stuff outside of the network and then came back to Viacom CBS at the time which is Viacom through Nickelodeon. Developed a couple of cartoons and, and made for uh, direct to video movies and then moved over to VH1 and now we've merged several times over. I've only been with the company now going on five years, but we've merged several times. So now I am under the MTV Entertainment Group, which is now nine networks. I work in production under the EBP head of production. So she oversees all nine networks, all the sh TV shows, movies and everything under those. And I basically, I say, produce her life. So I make sure she's where she's supposed to be, when she's supposed to be, and everything she could possibly need before she knows she needs it. Sure, absolutely. Well, and it's interesting, too, and we talked about this a little bit before we jumped on, um, how vastly different all of those networks' mandates are, their needs are, and being able to service each one of those sort of individually and, and being able to sort of compartmentalize and say, okay, this series would be great here not so much you know it might be great for MTV terrible for Smithsonian or right. you know and that that takes um I think a real sort of understanding of what everybody's looking for across all of your networks right correct we um something that's going to work for MTV would never work for VH1 or something for Comedy Central would never be put on a Smithsonian so yeah we I, I definitely have to know each network we are tasked to watch certain things during the day. So when we are actually in the office, there's a, a little TV or a little computer to the side that stuff is going constantly. So you're watching things as you're working at home. Um, I now have it set up to where I can do the same thing because since my boss does work for so many things, I have to watch stuff and give her reports on what's happening and who's doing what so that, yeah, you have to know everything so that when stuff comes in, I can go, yeah, that wouldn't fit Comedy Central, but that would be perfect for TV land. Sure, absolutely. And, and as a writer, I would think people coming to you as writers should have an idea of where something might fit based on whether it's their research or conversation they've had with you uh, or your colleagues, because you, you don't want to show up as a writer and be like, I've got this great television series and they say okay well where does it fit in and it's like I don't know you you know you tell me there has to be some sort of reconnaissance I think a writer should do as they are preparing their pitch. I completely agree and I've had a couple of um, consultations where I'll ask them where do you see your story and they'll say I don't know I just wrote it but I always try and tell them somewhere in the back of your mind where you see it fitting because even streaming oh I just wanted to stream well, HBO streaming is different from Netflix, which is different from Peacock, which is different from Paramount. You have to know what streaming you you actually want it for, where it's going to fit in that niche. That's that's such a fantastic point. I, I completely agree. Uh, well, look, we're so happy to have you here. And, and you know, like Mike, uh, Janine also works with us on the Stage 32 script services side. Um, Mike obviously does both on the script services and education side. Um, Janine, you... you routinely get phenomenal feedback from writers who work with you that you're supportive and uh incredible to work with and so thank you so much for being a part of thank of, you you got I look it forward to this absolutely and uh nat topping 
a friend of ours, a longtime friend of Stage 32, has been with us for quite a while. Um, he obviously, I'll let him introduce himself, but uh, last year, along with Mike, we had Bradley Gallo, who is, again, another dear friend of Stage 32 and a uh, fairly prolific independent producer, which I'm excited to talk about some of their projects. Uh, Nat, you run development uh, for Bradley over there. I do. So tell I us a little about yourself and your career. Sure. Um, I come from Detroit. I'm a Midwestern person. I thought coming out of undergrad that I was going to be a theater person. So I was a, um, an apprentice at the Purple Rose Theater in Chelsea, Michigan, which is owned by Jeff Daniels. So he's the first celebrity I ever met and he's a great guy. Um, and then after that, I moved to Chicago thinking that I would do sketch comedy and theater. So um, I was a North Sider, Mike, but I always preferred the White Sox over the Cubs. So um, Cubs fans really ruined it for me, I got to say. Um, anyway, uh, so I did that. I did sketch comedy and I took classes at Second City and I did shows at a place called uh, the Annoyance Theater and some shows at IO and a lot of independent stuff and learned a lot and had a great time. And after nine years of it, realized that I had made like no living from, for myself doing it. I always had to have a second job working in telecom. And after a while, you get tired of that. And you get tired of seeing your friends kind of drop out of the steam to go live their lives and raise families and all of this stuff. So I kind of reached this inflection point where I was like, well, either I should probably give this up or I should take out a lot of loans and go get an MFA degree <laughs> in film. And that's the decision that I made for some reason. So um, I moved to Orange, California, where I attended Chapman, uh, got an MFA in screenwriting. Um, while I was living that incredibly ludicrously charmed existence, which is like a film summer camp, I had to get an internship. And the internship that I applied for was Amasia Entertainment. And that's the job that I got when I eventually, <laughs> eventually graduated from school. So um, one of the instances where an internship actually leads to, to work. Sure. Um, so I got really, really lucky that way. I started as a part-time uh, development assistant I've worked my way up from there to being their development executive, basically running development for film and helping out our television executive, Tracy Mercer. Um, Amasia is the company that did the call with Halle Berry um, and Abigail Breslin. They did um, Mr. Wright with Sam Rockwell and Anna Kendrick. I joined shortly after that. Um, the first script that I ever recommended that we make was called Them That Follow. It went to Sundance, which is really, really cool. I got to go to Sundance. Um, and since then, we've done a, a small handful of other movies. The most recent is called Wild Mountain Time, which has Emily Blunt and Jamie Dornan and Christopher Walken and some other people that I'm forgetting, uh, written and directed by John Patrick Shanley. Came out over the winter in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> which was an awkward and strange and interesting way to do that, but we didn't really have a choice. But yeah, we're, we're very proud of the stuff that we've made. Yeah, and got glowing, glowing reviews. Um, you know, it's a fantastic project. Um, but then you also have, I mean, you've got some, some really big properties that you, as, even as independent producers, were able to, out of ingenuity and everything else, um, you know, take control of in terms, you know, preluding. Yeah, we have a um, film set up at Universal, um, a reboot or reimagining, I guess, of The Green Hornet, which is really exciting, um, particularly for me since The Green Hornet radio serials are from Detroit and I kind of grew up knowing about it and all of that stuff. So it's really, really cool. Um, on the TV side, uh, we have um, a version of Dark Shadows that we're working on right now as well. Um, which is really, really cool. People that um, grew up from that time know and love <laughs> Dark shadows, shadows, generally speaking, so it's really exciting. I didn't know it too terribly well. I only knew the Tim Burton movie, which I guess was not an accurate representation mm -hmm. of it. So I started watching some of the original. Right. I was like, man, there's something about this that's really just a lot of fun. So um, we're really looking forward to taking that around. We actually had it set up at CW at one point, but the pilot didn't go. Mm -hmm. um so we're taking it around to other places right now yeah absolutely i mean again it's and it's like i said earlier you know and mike sort of references as well there's the studio uh careers there's the studio you know side there's obviously the independent side but and, and both have their their pluses and minuses and people thrive in those careers um but net you've been on sort of you're on both sides of the tables a lot of time 
right? Mm-hmm. You're hearing pitches as a, an executive and as a producer and a production company, but then you've also got to sit on the other side of the table and pitch to Universal or pitch a concept to CW or Warner Brothers or any other studio that could ultimately take something on, right? What, how do you sort of capture that big idea, that big conceptual hook in, in a log line? What do you typically try to do? Or oh God, it's so, it's, it's very case by case, depending on the project that you're working on. A lot of times we're kind of this intermediary thing, entity between screenwriters and jobs. So a lot of times it's taking people's scripts or log lines or all of these things and kind of helping them develop it and shaping it and then putting it out in a way that is, um, you know, palatable to a studio or a network or all of these things. Um, and as Mike can walk you through, there's a whole process to go from log line to pitch packet and your your pitch meetings and all of this stuff. Uh, but generally, um, you know, it's it's definitely about that big concept and, and grabbing people's interest, but it's also about giving kind of a feel for what that central character is and that central character dynamic, if it's like a two person thing, because what we find is generally for story, character is what people really want. And they wanna know that the person or that the project that they're going to be watching, there's gonna be a cool, interesting human being or you know, creature anchoring mm-hmm. it that they can watch and enjoy. So a lot of times we'll, we'll try to get uh, writers or in our own pitching, we'll try to focus on like that one character and that character experience for them and trying to, to show the show through their eyes. Sure, absolutely. And that's one of the things, and, and Mike, you can test this, Gene, I'm sure you can as well. It's it's always interesting when a writer develops uh, a project or has an idea and they say, I've got a really great idea for a story or a plot. And they create characters that attempt to service the plot as opposed to creating a really interesting character that then we send on a, a, an interesting journey, you know, whatever that journey might be. Um, well, let's get into it, guys. I'm excited. I'm, you know, like I said, we sent you uh, log lines to review. Uh, you guys were obviously able to take a look at those and come up with your favorites, and you will uh, award a winner. Um, but before we do that, everybody who's watching, um, really the first rule about stage 32 is always talk about stage 32. The second rule about stage 32 is always talk about stage 32. So, with that in mind, uh, we are at stage 32 and at stage 32 scripts on Twitter and Instagram. If you hear something today, uh, uh, which already you, you must have, uh, if you hear something that's interesting that you want to uh, talk about, post, tweet, share, you are more than welcome to do that. Uh, we'd love to have our community be active and vocal and be a part of, of everything that we're doing. These are always interactive conversations as much as possible. Um, Janine, I'm gonna start with you actually. Um, we're gonna start on this. We're gonna start on the studio side because, again, like I said, you you have obviously have a number of different reasons why a logline might grab your attention. So uh, let's kick it off. For first off, tell me what about a logline grabs your attention right away. Um, am I gonna to want to watch that? Mm-hmm. Just the information you gave me is that something that I'm going to say? Ooh, I need to see that, or does it put more questions in my head? Oh, what they're saying is, is that gonna be more interesting? How did they possibly do that? What, which way did they go? Yeah, the more questions I have, the more interesting I, more interested I am. Unless the questions just don't make sense, you know? Right. <laughs> Sometimes you're asking questions because you just don't get what they're saying. It's asking the right questions, right? Not, yeah. not, not the way I don't understand questions. Yeah. A lot of times happens, sure, absolutely. Well, cool, well, with that in mind, uh, let's hear your first log, the first one that sort of grabbed your attention. It was called Forced. Mm-hmm. Higher doctor is stalked by a new resident at a retirement community when her adult doctors, our daughters are kidnapped. Her own past comes to light. Oh, interesting. and who is the writer of this log line? Do you have it there? This writer is Aaron Dooley. Okay, all right. Congratulations, Aaron. So uh, again, what what sort of had this, what, what about this log line jumped out for you? Um, well, I wanna know what in her past. Mm-hmm. And it's not like, you know, typical, it's little kids that are getting kidnapped and this one's now retired. She's at an old folks home. She's living, you know, her golden years. 
And here comes this whole stuff that I, I'm curious. I want to know what her past made people come and kidnap her, her kids. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. And, and what was your second one? Second was, it was called, the, the name I can't, I don't know how you say, M-A-J-K. Magic. Yeah, magic. Is that what that's supposed to be? Okay. Magic by Martin Rees. I know this project. Yes. Okay. In a world where humans live side by side with supernatural beings of many types, a human police detective joins a law enforcement division of supernatural beings while trying to save his fiance's murder by one of their own kind. So okay. it was the intrigue of this whole other world. And now he's got to go side by side with people who actually, well, the race that actually killed his fiance. So how is he going to deal with that? Yeah. It, yeah. A lot of, again, it, big, big hook, big idea right away that you sort of, you, that you get and uh, interesting, you know, timely, topical in an interesting way. Yeah. Right. So fantastic. And what was number three? An untried deputy and hunting guide find their lifelong friendship turning lethal as they track after the kidnappers of a waitress they both love, each suspecting the other's role in her disappearance. That's great as well. That's fantastic. Now, who's that by? That one is Russ, Russ Meyer, and it's called Jenna's Gone. All right. All right. And of these three, which one do you feel that's a... See, hold on, because I actually have four. Oh, great. Look at this. There's a bonus. I love this. This is great. I couldn't decide between these four. Okay. A window washer for a Manhattan skyscraper witnesses a strangulation murder through a window in early morning hours and becomes trapped on his platform when the murderer determines to murder him too. And it was called Vertical by Eric Christensen. I love that. That's very Hitchcockian. That's a very Hitchcockian... Yes. Rear view, yes, rear window. So yeah. those were my four. And out of the four, my favorite would be just going off of this, the retired doctor forced. All right, let's let's hear let's hear that log line one more time. Congratulations, okay. Aaron. Let's hear it one more a time. retired doctor is stalked by a new resident at a retirement community when her adult daughters are kidnapped. Her own past comes to light. All right. Well, congratulations, Aaron. That's fantastic. Uh, Aaron, we're going to go ahead and give you a uh, free Stage 32 pitch session with the executive of your choice. Um, obviously, Janine has pitch sessions. She's already booked up, which is unfortunate. Um, but uh, you can choose anybody on our roster. We're adding pitch sessions all the time. Uh, Angela, my uh, friend and colleague, will make sure you get that code and the link to sign up. But uh, congratulations. Fantastic. Uh, let's head on over to Nat and uh, see what he has to say. Hey, Nat, how are you? I'm still good. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing bad has happened in the interim I, I, last I was time great. I spoke. That was <laughs> By the way, that's a total premise for a film right there. If we're all on a Zoom and then somebody starts creeping up behind Mike, for instance, and we're trying to warn him, but we're all on mute. You see? It's good stuff. Yeah, this is why I'm against a blank wall. Right. No, one, no one can come up behind me. Exactly, exactly. Um, all right, let's hear it. First off, well, again, first off. Hold up. They oh, could oh. if they came through the wall. That's true. That's true. That's, That's true. true. No, absolutely. Well, now I have another reason to be paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Janine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So again, so really quickly, uh, I know we've touched on a little bit. What makes a great log line for you? Something that kind of jumps out at you. Um, one thing that we look for is um, not just like, is this a pro project or a script that we could see making, but also like, do I want to meet this writer, which can be a separate set of criterion as well. So a lot of times I'm looking for something, something unique and interesting, which makes me go, oh, this person might have a unique way of looking at the world or, you know, some interesting voice. And then I'm also looking, sometimes you can tell structurally within the log line if the writer has chops because there's certain structural things that kind of match between a, a screenplay and a, and a log line. So if it's a really nicely tautly written one sentence thing, I'll usually be able to go, oh, this is somebody that I can probably take seriously um, when I meet with them. So, um, so that, but that being said, like, as you're going to find out in this, 
people's reactions to these log lines are so subjective. So the things that I love and look for are completely different from what other people look for. And there's nothing you can do about it other than to try and represent your voice and your project in the best way that you're able to do. Sure, absolutely. Okay, with that in mind, what are the Let top three you love? Take a sip. I'll build the tension, okay. absolutely. My first log line. When two best friends accidentally kill Meryl Streep, they must find a way to fabricate their innocence without anyone in Hollywood becoming suspicious. It's called Fuck We Killed Meryl. I love it. Um, I remember this log line, yeah. The reason I like it, it's it's got one of those attention grabbing premises, basically the death of Meryl Streep. Are we going to be able to make this movie? I don't know. <laughs> a lot of times movies like this, scripts like this can be gimmicky and like get me in the door mm -hmm. sort of stuff. But that being said, if they're very well written, then a lot of times that will lead to, um, you know, as, as Mike said, you know, we're not gonna do your script, but we have this other project that we, you know, love for you to maybe take a look at and let's see if we can work together. And so. who are the writers on that one? I didn't write that down. Let me switch over to, it is Jessica and Ariel Kane. And I can't, the cell stops before I can get this last uh, name. I think, so. yep, yeah, but I think they are on. Yep, uh, Jessica Kane is here and uh, and Ariel. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ariel Relaford. Uh, all right, very cool. Glad you're in the top three at the very least. Uh, what's the next one? The next one is... A fierce African matriarch disguises herself to join a motley crew of pirates and embarks on a perilous journey to rescue her only son before a vicious warlord sells him to an English slave trader. Again, might not make that as an independent production company because it's a period piece and all of this other stuff. But from the log line, you, you get all of the main central characters in a way that's pretty evenly well laid out. It, it's specific, um, I know, the central character is a matriarch. I know that there's going to be a vicious warlord, English slave trader. I know what the period is without having to be told it. The one piece of information I would want to know is if it's a true story or if it's a fantasy, but that's something that you could just add at the beginning of the log line, a true story about blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I, that, again, it's one of those things. And you, you make a really interesting point about this being able to even tell a story in one sentence and you can sort of start to see the protagonist, the setup, the uh, obstacles and the sort of stakes, the or else, if they right. fail, you know, and the or else in here is obviously implied, he'll be sold off into slavery and, um, you know, terrible things will continue to happen if, unless she sort of reaches him. Um, that's a fantastic one. And do you have the writer uh, for that as well? That is Blackjack's. Um, Eric Karkic, I think. All right, Eric. Very nicely done. And uh, your final one, unless you had four, which is totally fine. <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm a slacker. I only did what was, what was <laughs> asked of me. I didn't go above and beyond. Um, that's why Janine gets to work for the nice corporation and I'm stuck at the, <laughs> <laughs> the independent production company. Um, all right. My last one is... After escaping a vengeful mob, a surly noble woman from an old country and her faithful companion struggle to regain the lifestyle they're accustomed to while broke and exiled in Los Angeles. Interesting. It's called Viscount and Maid Servant. That title would probably have to change, but right. the reason that I like it is I, I haven't read anything like this <laughs> and I, I read a lot. Um, gen like, Generally, if I see a log line and I'm like, oh, that's just like this other movie that I've seen, it becomes less interesting to me than reading something where I'm like, oh, a surly noble woman from the old country. I can kind of already imagine in my mind how that might be funny. It's a very classic kind of fish out of water um, setup without using a lot of the similar like tropes that you would expect. Um, it just makes me want to read it. like. Again, we might not make it, it might not be possible for us to get that off the ground, but it seems like whoever is coming up with the idea for this has an interesting way of looking at the world. Um, and so I'm gonna wanna potentially meet that person. Absolutely, well, and there's a, there's a, there's a quirkiness to it, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, with, even with the adjectives and 
the way you know uh, the noble woman society described as surly it does something that's tough to do in, in log lines. And I think that you guys will agree with this. Sometimes it's tough to set tonal expectations in a log line where you're able to say, unless it's obviously outlandish, like a, the premise about killing Meryl Streep, it's difficult to sort of set a tone in a log line uh, that's, that's completely clear if I read it right away. So I think that's sort of, you know, the surly noble woman exiled in Los Angeles. There's a quirkiness to that. I, I, I think we're picking up on, right? Yeah, and the economy of words is very, very important in a log line, I find. Like the longer that the long line goes on and the more sentences are in it, the, the less I wanna read it. And I know that's kind of a shitty thing to hear some, <laughs> somebody say, but it's true because like, if, if you're able to crystallize it into one sentence that's able to do that, then that's an impressive feat like being able to be short and to the point is actually a really valuable skill set to have in pitching because you're able to convey a lot of information very quickly in, in little amounts of words. So being able to add things like surly and, and being as descriptive as possible as quickly as possible is, is great. It's yeah, clutch. Absolutely. And uh, of those three, which one do you love? Which one is your winner? I love... Um, I'm, I've got a sketch comedy background, so I'm going to go with the Viscountess. Mm -hmm. It's Bad. a half hour comedy. I want to read it. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, it took me half hour to read. So yeah. And who is who is the writer on that? That was um, that is da, 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 da. Tara Strand. All right, Tara Strand, fantastic. Tara will get a. In fact, here's what we'll do. Uh, we'll give Tara Strand a free first ten review. Uh, in which somebody can read the first 10 pages of this and uh, give some feedback on that. Now, one of the things I, I, I brought up uh, earlier, um, you know, obviously Mike and Janine both work with us. Nat, um, despite his busy schedule, uh, did take pitch sessions with us and do some other consulting and coverage uh, things with us. We're working very hard to get Nat back. He, he promises us over the summer He's going to be back to work with us. So we'll keep once, following up and, and pressuring. Once we're done filming this thing that we're working on right now, then I should have some time free up. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I always tell, you know, we've, we've been getting so many great uh, writers to the platform, premises on the platform. It's been a lot of fun to watch some really great, uh, really great writers make some really great strides, which is, which is very, very cool. So um, you're always welcome to, uh, to come back and work with us, uh, you know, on a, on a more regular basis as well. So, all right, let's close it out with uh, Mike Disa. Now, Mike, um, it's interesting. I didn't realize that we also have, I mean, sort of animation running through this entire panel on some level, whether it's inspired by or, or working in. Um, I mean, talk about, a, talk about like just animation in general as a, as a format really quickly um, and what it allows you to do as a storyteller. Because I think that's a really interesting thing when you're talking about a premise for, for, for whether it's a feature or a series. Well, animation is, an, is a complicated thing. Um, um, it, it's like saying live action. You know, people ask you animation, you know, the same way you would, somebody you would talk to me about, well, explain low budget horror to me. You know, but animation is huge. <laughs> it, it's gigantic. And by that, I mean, it's complicated. The financial levers that you have to pull to make an animated project are very different depending on whether or not you're talking about a studio animated film, whether you're talking about a, a, a streaming television series, whether you're talking about an indie uh, project that's produced overseas and then brought it here as a negative pickup. I mean, it's as complicated as, as the live action. But in general, um, if, if, if you're go as a writer, people like to, um, jump into animation because they're they feel they're not limited by budgets or reality or the amount of special effects and things like that and that's both true and untrue and uh i've got a, somewhere on this uh, on stage 32 i have a lecture a recorded lecture i do where i talk where i explain all the different genres within animation and how they each have particular formats you know for instance there is no such thing as a half hour adventure drama in animation you know, there's half hour sitcom like comedies, hmm. there's hour long animator, you know, so I'm saying it, it, it's stuff like that. So one of the things I would recommend if you're interested in animation is to, well, he says, unmodestly, and I apologize, is watch that. Uh, because yeah. one of the biggest mistakes I see is people with fantastic ideas, shooting them at the wrong format. You know, like I've got a great idea for this adventure series and they're pitching it, you know, to um, Comedy Central. 
as you know and I'm like no comedy central does half hour comedies in animation they don't do you know um they don't do avatar um and so or you can pitch something as an adult project which is really more of an action you know teen project or you can pitch something that you know, as a movie that's really a TV series and on and on and on. Um, it's, it's complicated and it's big. And that's why so many people eventually connect with it. Um, it's been very popular over the lockdown because um, the sweatshop, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the sweatshop the, the sweat um, not paying your employees much a pattern has worked out well for big companies during the, <laughs> during the lockdown, but also the fact that you can do uh, remote, um, re remote work. So it has, it has gotten a lot of buzz, but uh, it's one of those things you need to approach with a targeted, you know, targeted, because unlike a lot of other, uh, unlike Nat, for instance, who can uh, clearly look at a premise and is looking for talent and understands, okay, even though I may not want, I may not be able to physically produce this, I want to meet this writer and have a relationship with somebody, which is, you know, rare, you know, um, in animation, if you present, you know, a Disney movie to Rob Zombie, or if you present, you know, uh, something that's just wildly out of, uh, out of the marketplace to the wrong people, you know, you're not going to get very far. So what you yeah. want to do is just do some, his, do some studying. Right. Absolutely. Well, and, and, you know, I think everybody here watching realizes um, the, the, the breadth and scope of knowledge that you have. And so I would encourage everybody to, to check out um, all of Mike's webinars um, and classes and whatnot. Um, there's some really good stuff in there. And I know that you're, you're continuing to do stuff with us, which is really exciting. So um, all right. And by the way, guys, before we get into this, um, obviously for all of you watching uh, at home, uh, if your log line was not chosen or highlighted today, do not fret. Let not your heart be troubled. Uh, we have two more webcasts that uh, we will be announcing winners on. So this is just the first one of, of uh, three. So make sure you're tuning in next week and the week after if you're not uh, chosen because we will have uh, a complete new panel of judges completely new uh, uh, review of log lines. So you are very much still in the running if you have not been chosen uh, yet. But with that in mind, Mike, let's kick it off. What are, what's, what's your first of your three faves? Okay, if, before I did that, if you wouldn't mind, I just briefly want to put some context in this. First, first of all, though, I really want to tell the, the participants that, you know, obviously I read a lot of log lines and I've done this before. And this is the strongest batch of log lines I have ever been presented in this setting. I'm not kidding even a little bit. These are some very good log lines. A couple of them can use a little polishing in terms of wordiness like Matt was talking about, but there wasn't one of them I went, <laughs> you know, I, I don't even know what they're talking about. I mean, that's, that's, that's rare, guys, it's really good. So um, I, everybody, stay committed and keep going even if uh, we, we, we don't pick you today because none of these are shut the door bad log lines. All of these are kind of interesting. Um, as far as why I picked what I picked today, um, I've decided that every time I do this, I'm gonna come up with a different persona. Let me explain what I mean by that. Right now in my career, what I found is, is that I'm getting things picked up and I've, I'm starting to get a feel that I didn't have when I was younger for what kind of projects are going to get picked up by a particular, you know, uh, company that I'm working with. And right now I'm working with three companies that do live action. One is overseas and a couple are here and they're, they're small. I mean, you know, uh, they knows all about this. It's, 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 you know, you've got small companies. So um, I was thinking like, okay, if I was going to attach myself to a project, because I'm now too old to do that just for fun, I only attach myself to things that can make me money. What projects here could I actually, I think, not only sell, but possibly attach myself to, to get made? Okay, so that's what I'm thinking about. That doesn't mean the other ones aren't good. It's just that I'm not a Disney exec. So there are certain projects that are just too big. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just that, that's, where, that's where my head's at right now. And that's why you target who you pitch to. I guess so um, as much as I loved all of them, my number three is Blackjacks. And um, for all the same reasons that Nat liked it, it's a very good log line because a good log line does three things very, very well. You, it expresses the tone and genre of the project. Now you have to do that in the sentences while you're doing other things. Just don't make a list of the tone, <laughs> but it's tone and genre. Why? Because everybody who's reading this makes a living in a particular genre probably, has financiers who wanna work in a particular genre and genre and tone are, are sometimes very similar. 
So is it a gritty sci-fi show? Is it a gritty detective story? Is it a silly love story? Is it a slapstick comedy? I got to know that by the time I'm done reading your, your logline, you're saving people time and money. The other thing a uh, logline has to do is very succinctly uh, communicate to me the hook and the premise. You know, and sometimes that's the same thing. That's the other thing. And, and that's what both of the other panelists talked about. Basically, when they say, I want to read it, I'm asking questions, or, um, you know, I really want to get to know this writer. And I, you know, I, I, I want to read this, even though I might not be able to make it myself, is the hook and the premise were so good that they were expressed well, that people want, to, you know, get attracted to it. And you can pitch it easily. Everybody wants to repitch your log line. So if, if, it's, if it's got a hard, good hook, people get into it. The other thing is you have to, and Nate mentioned this too. Now, I'm sorry. I mentioned this too, is the fact that I, I need to know a little something about the leads because maybe I'm looking for a female driven, you know, project. Maybe I'm looking for a male driven uh, project. Maybe I'm looking for an African-American driven project. Maybe I'm looking for something with, you know, three women, two men, a puppy, a monkey and a fish. You know, if you, you don't tell me who the, you know, because economically, you know, that's one of the, the things that, you know, that how projects get made. So you got to tell me a little bit about the lead, especially guys, remember, you're not just pitching to studios, you're also pitching to managers and agents sometimes. These right. log lines and these samples you do can get you management, can get you repped if an agent or a, a manager likes what you do, right? And agents and managers like projects that they can, you know, attach other people they manage to. So if it's so vague that I don't, I can't see the lead, neither can an agent. And an agent isn't going to be interested in a property they can't see the lead in. So um, Blackjacks did that very well. No, just, Blackjack did that just to, very well. to remind us, read that log line again, if you can, just to, to remind us of what it was. Okay. I should read a completely different log line so the person just goes nuts. That would be fun. Okay. A fierce African matriarch disguises herself to join a motley crew of pirates and embarks on a perilous journey to rescue her only son before a vicious warlord sells him to the English slave trader. Okay, I'm never thrilled about the word motley <laughs> used in, in, a, uh, in a pitch because it's one of those words that doesn't really mean anything. But other than that, that is a very good log line. Excellent. I know the genre, I know it's a period piece, I know I'm gonna need boats. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I know it, uh, who it stars, I know the conflict. I know the stakes. Um, right. you know, it, it's it's something very interesting, and I happen to be working with an overseas company right now that um, is is doing a period is shooting right now a period series in Ireland. So I'm like, there you go. That's not out of the question of what they could do. Sure. All right. Number two. The next one was the Quiet Box. Now, as an independent filmmaker who works with independent filmmakers, I'm really attracted to, at the moment, high concept limited scope projects. I mean, sometimes you'll see on uh, various web spaces where they're looking for scripts, they'll say things like looking for a horror film, you know, a high concept horror film with one set. You know? <laughs> that's, that's an actual genre. So the idea of the quiet box is just, I, I thought this was haunting. Let me read this to you. Sure. Um, and it, it also picked up, both of my top picks picked up on some of my fears. A claustrophobic young woman finds herself trapped in a large confined box and must figure out its mystery without giving into the madness. Literally, a woman wakes up in a box. Holy crap. Sure. <laughs> and that could really work. And more importantly than that, that can get made. Mm -hmm. You know, that can get made without spending a lot of money. So if you want to get your first script sold and made, and you like that genre, please don't chase genres you're not interested in. But if you like that genre, a project like that, you know, there's a lot of people who can finance that. And sure. that could go out on Shutter. And depending on who you get to, though, you can also pitch a show, a project like that to an actress with some chops, with some heat right now, and they might want it, mm -hmm. you know, to, to prove, you know, especially if that person is known for comedy or other genres, they might want to do something like that to show their chops. So I think that's a great Long line. I mean, it just scares the crap out of me, to be honest with you. All right. And number three. And number three is, uh, you've heard this one before. It's um, Vertical. Vertical is, uh, so just to read that again, a window washer for a Manhattan skyscraper witnesses a strangulation murder through a window in the early morning hours and becomes trapped on his platform when the murderer determines to murder him too. Now, you use the word murder too many times. So you might remember that people also are killers. 
you know, or psychopaths. So like you, you don't have to use the word murder that many times. But having said that, look, if you ever see um, uh, the documentary uh, on the wire, on the wire, mm -hmm. it's about the guy who did the tightrope walk between the two, two towers, yeah. twin towers. I had coffee with the, uh, with the filmmaker who made that once. And I was like, literally, I wanted to throw up the whole time I was watching your show, your movie. And it got nominated for an Academy Award and everything. And that's kind of what you could do with this. You can see how, like, what you could do. I'm just talking as a filmmaker now. I'm like, okay, wow, that's a tense, the word Hitchcockian was used, I would say psychological drama mm -hmm. about a guy trapped, you know, on, on this thing, trying desperately to get away from somebody who's stalking him through the building and is waiting for him at the top. And you can see how, you know, this could get very stunty and very, very intense. But you could also shoot this in a way if you had a little more money, especially using drones, that this could be a really, really breathtaking movie for, for not, a, not spending a huge amount of money other than obviously on insurance. And you could, and in terms of casting, because you told me about the murderer and the person, I can see stunt casting a really good actor to play the murderer and a stunt person to play the, the window washer. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can see how this could kind of work. I, I mentioned this to my wife and, and she's like, um, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the movie. It's one of the most popular, uh, the one where the guy's trapped in the building at Christmas, help me. Uh, Die Hard. Die Hard. She's like, it's Die Hard, but the opposite. Instead of being trapped in the building, you're trapped outside yeah. the building. Well, there's a little, there's a little bit of uh, a phone booth in there. Remember the Joel Schumacher movie? Yeah. Booth, you know? Yeah, or uh, 40, what is it? 40, fa 40 fathoms yeah. down with the shark. So yeah. something like this is a, is, is something a independent company could get their hands around especially if they if they cast it correctly and got somebody interested it's also a great example of a of, of, if you take a script of a taught psychological thriller that actually could lead to like a gig writing for procedurals and stuff so i, I liked it very much um if i was going to attach myself to direct one it would be vertical just because of the challenge of doing it, I would also spend the entire production time throwing up because I'm terrified of, of heights, but that's one of the reasons I think everybody does. Yeah. So it's good. Now, of that's those... what you want, your director vomiting at Video right. Village while you're... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thir... It happens more often than you think. 40 stories above the ground. Yeah, just... Right. Yeah. Exactly. All right, Mike, of those three, which one do you love? I'm which gonna say vertical. Movie? I'm gonna say vertical, but all three of those were awesome. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I think vertical is is fantastic. Um, and for that, you know, I think that again, I would love to get that out into the market. I want people to, to be able to see that. So let's uh, let's give the writer vertical uh, a pitch session to uh, see if you can find somebody. Um, now, we're obviously wrapping up here. Guys, again, if you were not chosen, come back next week and the week after that. Um, and remember that uh, Janine, Mike, and eventually Nat are all on the website, uh, stage32.com for various uh, script services, education. Mike's currently teaching uh, several things with us. Janine is obviously on the site for consultations, uh, gets rave reviews. Um, and like I said, we're bringing Nat back right as uh, production comes to an end in summer. Um, Janine, really quickly, closing thoughts, uh, just in general about, you know, working with Stage 32 with writers on Stage 32. Um, the writers, they, they're learning their stuff. I'm usually very impressed with what they come with, whether it's pitch sessions or consultations. Um, the only thing I, I would say is a little more homework so you know where you want your stuff to go, knowing your genres. But I, I do have to agree with Mike. These were some really amazing log lines um and the fact that we overlapped on quite a few between you know nat myself and and mike so congratulations to all semi-finalists and finalists and really really great job absolutely absolutely and uh, nat closing thoughts before we uh, wrap it up here um just really great job with the log lines and just keep in mind that being a writer is a lifelong journey and learning is something that you're never going to <laughs> stop doing hopefully so yeah. you can always even even seasoned writers will learn a new thing or two on writing log lines or better ways to do some of these things so just keep in the mindset that you're always trying to make yourself a little bit better as you go absolutely absolutely well thank you guys and, and mike thank you so much for uh, again 
teaching with us and being a part of what we do. Thank you, Janine, so much, and Nat for for being a part of what we do. Thank you guys for tuning in. Again, we are back here next week. Um, if you're watching this uh, on demand, if you're watching this on YouTube and you did not get the link and you're like, oh my God, Jason, I didn't get the link. That's probably because you're not getting our emails. Make sure that uh, you have a uh, Stage 32 account set up and you're receiving notifications from us. That's the quickest way to hear about all that's going on on Stage 32. In the meantime, everyone have a fantastic rest of your week. Remember to tag us on social media at Stage 32 and at Stage 32 Scripts. Uh, we are on Twitter and Instagram, and we will see you on the platform. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your weekend, guys. And uh, thank you, everybody on the panel. Take care, guys. Bye. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Bye.